Hey, deserving listeners, I thought I would answer patron emails. This first email is from an anonymous patron from London. He writes, and by the way, trigger alert, we're going to be talking about childhood sexual abuse. If you want to skip over this, I might skip ahead about 15 minutes or so. He writes, in my late 30s, I'm in my late 30s, and I live in London, England. In group therapy, I opened up about the sexual abuse I endured as a child at the hand of my mother. This went on for many years, the sexual abuse with my mother as a child. I understand why she did this, though. She was never given any love as a child. Her parents didn't want her, and she was beaten on a daily basis as a child. I assume that's why she desperately craved love and attention, and she used me for it. Problem is, to this very day, she regularly tells me that she's obsessed and in love with me and wants to be physically close to me, despite the fact that I am gay and now married. My partner has witnessed her behavior and is disgusted by it, as am I. I try my best to be as distant as I can, and everyone tells me to sever all, to sever all ties with her, but I know for a fact that it would kill her. She gets drunk and is emotionally extremely fragile, and I just couldn't live with myself if she did anything to herself. What is this inappropriate love from a parent towards a child called? Is it some some kind of reverse Oedipus complex? End of email. Well, first off, Anonymous from London, I'm terribly sorry you went through this. That is rough. The exploitation of a parent in that way is uh, is a terrible thing to go through. We deserve parents who love us and respect our boundaries and raise us well, and I'm so sorry that, that you went through that. Uh, your question is, you know, what is this love called? What, what, what is it? How do we conceptualize it? Well, it's hard for me to know, obviously, because I would have to assess her, but there are many possible conceptualizations that people would... Uh, you know, hypothesize at the beginning of the assessment phase. One is is your conceptualization, which is that she's just trying to get her attachment needs met, and she doesn't know any other way to get it except through what she believes to be safe relationships. And sometimes people who are afraid or distrustful or whatever of people their own age or people outside their family, they might perceive their own children to actually be the only safe people on the planet because parents will, you know, rightfully so feel like, well, my kids need me and they need me in particular. And so that can feel very safe to a parent as a relationship. And if you don't feel safe outside of your family, outside of your children, then you are at risk of using your children for inappropriate relationships. Inappropriate meaning that it harms the child. So that's one conceptualization is that you were a safe person that she could get her attachment and sexual needs met through. And that's basically what you're saying. Uh, Another conceptualization that overlaps with yours is that she is a psychopath and or a sadist who likes to exploit weaker people for her own gain. And she actually doesn't prefer to have other kinds of relationships. She she likes relationships where she's in total control. She likes relationships in which she is harming other people. This is actually something that I don't talk about that much, uh, talk about that much, but it it's definitely a personality disorder. There are many people who will either live a lifestyle or even s- slip in and out of a, a mode where they actually enjoy exploiting other people. It makes them feel good. Uh, in the old days, we would call this sadistic personality disorder. Um, in contemporary times, I still call it that. It's essentially something went wrong with your wiring or your upbringing or something, development, where you gain pleasure in something that the vast majority of humans gain no pleasure from. It's, uh, you know, typical humans do not gain pleasure from uh, exploiting children, for example, and, and watching them suffer or forcing yourself on someone else physically or sexually and enjoying it when the other person actually is expressing displeasure. This is, this is sadistic personality. 
And it is uh, rare, extremely rare, but it is a thing that exists. And so it's possible that's another conceptualization. And there are many other conceptualizations, but the fact is, is that we don't really know why anyone does anything. So including why, why your mom did what she did, we could hypothesize with some um, broad strokes, like the fact that she was completely mistreated growing up and that had some effect on her relationships, on her sexuality, on her um, you know, expression of attachment, that kind of thing. Um, the other thing that might be notable to people is that you seem to still have at least some level of care for her. You say that you, you know, she's emotionally fragile and you just couldn't live with yourself if anything happened to her. And for some people, they might be confused by that. And in my early days, I would have been as well. But I've heard so many stories from clients and a lot of you listeners have, have emailed me. And we've actually had people on the podcast talking about this before where they actually, the victims, will actually have affection for their abuser. And it's complicated, right? Because uh, it's this is your mother. This is someone who wasn't just the person who abused you. Also, what exactly is abuse? Is it experienced as abuse by the victim? Not always. Now, this is not some sort of veiled endorsement of this behavior. It is uh, far, far from it. But what society could benefit by recognizing is that victims will have sometimes very complicated feelings about their abuser, particularly if it was someone that they had a close relationship with, whether it was a family member or a older friend or whatever. The relationship can have, can have a lot of different elements to it. It can have abusive, scary moments, exploitative moments, but it can also have affectionate moments, safe moments. Um, you know, sense of humor being shared moments. So it can, it can be quite complicated over time. And uh, we all maybe could benefit by recognizing that uh, for victims' sake. So because a lot of times what victims will uh, worry about is if they express their feelings, their the wide range of their feelings, they're, they're worried that they're going to be seen as some kind of sicko or that they haven't graduated to some emotional level yet, that they're still in Stockholm Syndrome, which is possible, by the way, anonymous from London. It's possible that in 20 years, you'll look back at your time now in your 30s and conceptualize yourself in your 30s as being still brainwashed by her, still in Stockholm Syndrome about her. It's also possible that your feelings won't change at all towards her, and you'll look back and you'll conceptualize yourself 20 years from now is the same way that you do now. So there's a lot of different ways that people will think about it. And uh, victims deserve us as allies to be open to their experience and not stigmatize their reaction. Uh, there are many people till their dying days will hold affectionate feelings about their abuser. And many of you out there probably can relate to that. Now, there are many people, victims, who have no ambivalence at all and 100% loathe their abuser, and they are also entitled to their experience and to their reaction. Nothing wrong with that either, as most of us could agree. All right, let's go on to another email. All right, this next email is from patron Siri from Berlin. She writes, I've been coping quite well with the whole coronavirus situation, but what really bugs me is the amount of people refusing to wear a mask, even when it is mandatory to wear them. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the psychology behind that, because I have a hard time empathizing with people like that. It just feels so ignorant to me, but at the same time, it is draining me constantly to spies people around me. Oh, it's, it's, it's draining me to constantly despise people around me. End of email. Yeah, there's lots to say here, and there's many cognitive phenomena at play, but just briefly, uh, some factors that I can think of off the top of my head is these are speculative since I haven't done any research, and we, I don't know of any research, and we haven't had enough time to at least look at Americans with, and maybe people in Berlin regarding this phenomenon, but uh, there are a few small things, like it physically feels bad to wear a mask, 
uh, some, and it's foreign, right? It's a, it's a new thing to a lot of people. In my town of Seattle, uh, there would be Asians who would wear uh, masks and other sorts of people, but it was pretty rare to see someone wearing a mask. And so it, it's, it's new. And whenever there's something new, there's going to be an adjustment. Uh, I also imagine that some people actually have breathing anxiety. There is a, such a thing of worrying about not getting enough oxygen and not being able to function very well. And, and maybe your anxiety causes you to think certain political things. I don't know. The other definite possibility when you watch these videos online is mental illness. Whenever I see these Karen videos going around, I highly suspect that a good percentage of those quote unquote Karens are people suffering from mental illness. Uh, a little bit on Karens. I've talked about this before. Um, I'm a person who looks at Reddit every day. It's, it's like the one of the very first things I do. I'm still in bed and I'm flipping through Reddit. I'm not a Twitter person or really a Facebook person or an Instagram. I'm, in, I'm a Reddit person. I like to read things on Reddit. And I saw the whole Karen thing crop up months and months ago. And right away, I thought, the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, it's kind of clever. It's like Karen's, yeah, you know, Karen really does sum it up because there's a certain age range of women who are named Karen. And past that, there's not a lot of Karens. There are some. It's basically people my age, I'm 49, and a little older, you know, say 10, 20 years. And so I thought it was funny the first time I saw it, but then I saw it proliferate and I just thought, no, 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 no. Uh, this is not okay. One, there are several people named Karen who are being lumped in with this, which is just stupid. The other thing is, is do we have a name for older white men who do this sort of thing? No. So this is just highly sexist. It's very, uh, uh, you know, one-sided. Anytime there's a Karen uh, then that gets posted. What, and I was actually talking about this with Christy, who might actually be listening right now. She's been on the podcast. We were laughing about trying to come up with the male equivalent of a Karen, and she came up with Scott. <laughs> They're thinking there's not a lot of Scots these days. There, you know, Scots are probably my age and older, our age and older. Anyway, uh, so I don't. Uh, if you're one of those people out there who wants to speak out against bad behavior in society, feel free to just call it out as bad behavior. Feel free to say old white women bad behavior. I don't know, but don't say Karen. Like that's just I, I don't understand that. But anyway, um, so uh, and a, as a the golden rule, do unto others. Imagine if your name for whatever reason, just became associated with one of the worst things on the internet. And this is, and society just went along with that notion. Let's just call, you know, all Jennifer's or, you know, your Siri. Let's, let's just call everyone's, everyone's iPhones is blown up right now. Um, you know, let's, let's call everyone who's, who's named Emma or everyone who's named, um, you know, Alexis. <laughs> Why am I having a hard time coming up with, Names, but anyway, the point is, is you know, do unto others, people. You know, so point is, is that many people are suffering from mental illness, and one of the things that can happen to a very small percentage of those people with mental illness, with say schizophrenia, for example, will at times rant and rave in public because their delusions are compelling them to do so, or their delusions are informing their worldview that compels them to do so. And to just turn a camera, a phone camera on people on the street who were even yelling racist things and just say, like, look at that, Karen. I think it's it's running the risk of exploiting and making fun of people who are suffering from mental illnesses. Now, are there people out there who are perfectly, uh, you know, who, who aren't suffering from a mental illness and aren't delusional? And absolutely will gleefully go on camera and rant and rave and say racist things. Absolutely. So, but there's just no way to distinguish that I can tell. When I see these on these videos on Reddit, I'm like, uh, I'm always kind of looking for some kind of marker of mental illness of which it'd be hard from a video like that. But, but that's another reason why someone wouldn't wear a mask in public is because they are delusional. And then you put a camera on them in the Walmart and they start going crazy and they're, you know, they're yelling at, at everyone. Well, uh, it, don't assume that the person is operating 
from a place of non-mental mental illness. So the fourth factor that I'll mention, which of course everyone is waiting for me to talk about, I'm, I'm sure, is the echo chamber. The echo chamber is probably the biggest reason why people don't wear masks. I don't know about Germany, which is where you're emailing from, Siri, but in the United States, th this is the main reason as far as I can tell. It, this is just my speculation. We live, as I always say in this podcast, we, we live in a society where there are two distinct echo chambers. And very few people are not in one of the echo chambers. And in the Republican echo chamber, there's a lot of talk about freedom, but only of certain kinds. There is meaning that they emphasize, you know, I have the freedom not to wear a mask, but I also have the freedom, but, but, do, but you don't have the freedom of your own body if you're a woman, you know, those kinds of uh, hypocrisies, if you will. So, um, you know, and the thing I always think about the mask thing, it's like, well, there's all sorts of freedoms that you don't have. Like, I'm pretty sure across the United States, at least in Washington state, you have to wear your seatbelt. And that law has come into, uh, you know, into play during my lifetime. When I grew up in the 70s, no one wore a seatbelt in their car. In the 80s, some people kind of started to wear it. But, but I think it was like midway through the 80s when they made it mandatory for everyone to wear a seatbelt. And that was a big deal. A lot of people spoke out against it. And I actually didn't like it at first. It annoyed me. I didn't like wearing my seatbelt. Because imagine growing up for 15 years and never wearing a seatbelt. And then all of a sudden having to wear a seatbelt. Now, I can't imagine being in a car and not wearing a seatbelt. <laughs> but anyway... So there's all sorts of freedoms that you don't have. Like you don't have the freedom to buy Coke. You don't have, you know, co cocaine. You don't have the freedom to smoke a J in the middle of a library. You know, there's all sorts of freedoms you don't get. And including you wear a mask to help to save lives from other, you know, other people. But anyway, uh, but in, the, in certain echo chambers, there will be definitions of freedom that will be completely different and will really brainwash the population who is in that echo chamber. Uh, the other elements, so the, the reason why I can kind of speculate about what the conservative echo chamber is talking about in terms of masks is because I actually will dip into it sometimes. I can only tolerate it for so long, but I, I will do it because I feel like it it helps me to understand people better because, you know, there's a lot of in my echo chamber, uh, there's talk about conservative because I'm in the liberal echo chamber. When my echo chamber talks about conservatives, we tend to be like, oh, they're they're just a bunch of idiots. They're immoral people who don't care about human lives. They they don't care about science. They're just a bunch of dullard people with low IQs. And, you know, it's, it's just there's it, that's the way it's talked about. They're just so stupid and racist and white supremacist and all this kind of stuff. Now, there's some truth to those statements, uh, uh, not the dullard part, but the the racism uh, part is there. there's definitely more racist rhetoric in the conservative echo chamber for sure. But it's not like the left doesn't have racists, you know. So, and it's not like the left doesn't have racist rhetoric or any kind of other oppressive rhetoric, because it does for sure. So, uh, so it's not a dichotomy there. But anyway, I, I like to dip into it every now and then because it helps me to understand people. Anyway, so when when I dip into it, um, there are certain things that if you stay there long enough, some of the stuff starts to make some sense because you just hear it spun in this whole other way. And unless you have access to data and research and strong rhetoric to counteract what they're saying, it's hard to, it's hard to, it's hard to contradict them, you know, especially if you stay in an echo chamber for a good week, you start saying, well, you know, there's, there's some truth there because there is some truth there. There is some truth that making people wear masks is against one's freedoms. You know, there is, there's a grain of truth there. Now, we want to look at the bigger picture, which is people are dying left and right. And if we can uh, slow down the virus and or even, uh, you know, eliminate it at, or, you know, get rid of, it, I don't know the medical term, but get rid of it within the populations uh, as other societies have done, by the way, <laughs> around the world, there are societies that have done, uh, they have, you know, the population has followed the recommendations for the most part. And they've eradicated the virus from their 
from their population. And so the fact that we still have it in our uh, society is evidence that we're not doing what our experts have been telling us to do. It's not like we have a different set of experts. Experts around the world agree, do X, Y, and Z. This is what you're supposed to do. And we just, as a society, didn't do that. Why? Because we have politicians who deny science and have, have a reason to peddle on fears to get votes. That's all they're doing. And also marketers who are trying to market to conservatives in a certain way, which that's a whole other conversation. But anyway, so in the conservative echo chamber, and I'm saying conservative in, in air quotes to some extent, because it's not necessarily the conservative echo chamber. There's certainly a lot of conservatives who would totally agree with everything I'm saying regarding a mass. There are many, uh, in fact, I would venture to say that most Republicans, most conservatives agree that wearing a mask is the right thing to do. So I, I don't even want to say that all, you know, it's not like all Republicans aren't wearing masks. It's not like all conservatives aren't wearing masks, but I'm just saying like, uh, you know, the, shall we say like the, the more extreme end of the echo chamber anyway. Um, and there's a spin on science in that echo chamber. The, you know, they'll, they'll take a grain of truth and they'll blow it up. So they'll say like, well, the masks don't really help you because it, it just protects other people from you. So if you don't have the virus, then you don't need to wear a mask, you know, that kind of thing. Or they'll say, well, you know, the virus isn't that bad. It's only killing X amount of people every month, which is comparable to the amount of people who die from the flu. You know, they, they take a grain of truth and they spin it in a way that helps them in terms of what they're trying to do. Um, and... So, you know, the main reason why people aren't wearing masks in my society, I don't know about Berlin, is the echo chamber. And when you're in it and that's just your life and, and you're just trying to put food on the table and, you know, have some fun on the weekend, you don't have a lot of time to look into and be critical of your echo chamber. You're just fed a certain stream of brainwashing and you just end up believing, especially if you're fed, you're fed that information from the day you're born because your parents were in that echo chamber. And so it's asking a lot to ask people in society to question their echo chamber, especially when the echo chamber will say the only reason why the other echo chamber is saying this, you know, if anyone ever tries to oppose your ideas, it's because they're a liberal uh, snowflake and they, they're not a real American. You know, there's certain um, ideas that basically assure that the echo chamber will remain strong. And of course, those in power in the echo chamber have a lot of interest in making sure you stay in the echo chamber and are a billion percent uh, suspicious of people on the other side of the aisle. So it's a lot to ask. And so when I see people on the internet who aren't wearing masks, those are the things I think. I think, well, echo chamber, one, and two, mental illness. And it's, I just feel bad for them. You know, I feel bad for people who are, have been brainwashed. It's, it's not like they woke up in the morning one day and said, I'm going to be a jerk face about masks and other things about race and about science. They, they don't know any better. How, how are they supposed to know any better? We need to have a system of government and leadership that actually leads in a scientifically based way, in a way that actually helps our society, in a way that you know puts people together. The fact that COVID and masks are even politicized is because of leadership. It wasn't inevitable that masks were going to be politicized. It was politicized by politicians. And I will put liberal politicians in that camp, too. Now, it was, in my estimation, mostly Donald Trump and, and, and other people uh, of his ilk. But there were, you know, when, when this f first thing started happening, uh, Trump was... Uh, he hadn't really, in my estimation, hadn't really solidified his position. You know, I'm talking back in March and April. And I saw uh, liberals starting to pounce on Donald Trump in a way that I was worried because I was like, if you pounce on him, he's going to dig in. And so, you know, why don't you work together? You know, I don't know what politicians do all day, but I, 
I, I wonder how much time they spend actually sitting down to say, okay, what's the goal here? Let's figure this out together. Let's not worry about tweets. Let's not worry about press conferences. Let's just try to solve the problem. But we live in a society that's constantly, you know, worried about tweets and cameras on because, you know, everyone's trying to get votes. And the people who get the most cameras get the votes. And so we live in this very strange society. Now, it's not like before there were cameras and Twitter, we had a wonderful political landscape. I'm old enough to know that. But uh, I don't know. I'm just ranting. <laughs> um, I, I, I have a lot of compassion for people who I, I, I understand why people are doing some of these things. Um, I don't sympathize <laughs> as a evidence-based science uh, oriented person. Uh, um, I, I would have no problem if the government said, if you don't wear a mask, you're going to prison. <laughs> I, I just have no problem with that. Uh, I, I would love a, a government. That, so I, I don't have any sympathy for people who aren't wearing masks, but I definitely have sympathy. I definitely have sympathy for people who are uh, a product of their echo chamber, a product of the power structure. That's what systems theory provides us is you can't just look at someone wearing a mask and say that's a bad that's you know you can't look at someone who's not wearing a mask and say that's a bad person you zoom out and you see the big picture that person exists within a system what is that system how do we define that system that that's that's what we have to change we have to change systemically we can't just post about karens on reddit and say look at this dimwit we have to zoom out and say what's happening here and I will say, you know, one of the things that I have said before is when you ridicule the other side of the aisle, when you ridicule a whole group of people, it hurts their feelings, even if you think that they deserve it. But when you ridicule them, it hurts their feelings. What do people do when their feelings are hurt? I talk about this all the time. Hurt is a primary emotion. Well, when we don't feel safe, we, we, utilize, we utilize secondary emotion, secondary emotions, such as anger. So when we hurt the other side, when we ridicule them and we make fun of them, we hurt their feelings, which is obvious, but I feel like no one understands it. And then what do you do when you provoke someone? Well, they come out swinging. They come out protecting themselves. So we need to stop ridiculing. We need to start talking with, start assuming people are coming from a good place. Let's reach out to them. The, you know, when we reach out, then we can actually change minds. We can actually change our system and change our society. Just ridiculing them makes it worse. I'm here to tell you. That's my opinion. I have no data for that. But I, I've i been thinking about this for years. And it's, you know, I'll often say, I love Stephen Colbert, but I, I worry sometimes about what that does. You know, we all need a vent, you know, an outlet to make, to laugh um, but I wonder about what it what it's doing to our society that we have charismatic ridiculers of whole you know half the country or thirty percent of the country, whatever you want to say. Uh, we need to work together. You know, imagine if you had a problem at work and there was you know you were working at a say you're all working at a you all own a restaurant, okay? The ten of you own three restaurants together and three people of three of the owners, you know, they want to start serving sat more salads and you think that's a bad idea. And when you're at the board meeting, you just, you just laugh at, Oh, those are the salad idiots. Oh, look at the salad idiots with their stupid salads. Well, that wouldn't be, all of us understand that's not a functional way of trying to solve a problem. A functional way is like, okay, well, let's talk about it. I, you know, here are my ideas about salads. Uh, here's your ideas. Now, a lot of you will say, well, I've tried that. I've tried to talk with, and they come back with their own uh, hurtful statements. Yeah, but two wrongs don't make a right. And if all we do is dig our heels in because we're hurt, and then we're not going to get anywhere. So, uh, I, I, honestly, you know, I've had this little rant before. I can't imagine I'm going to change anything. I, I guess, I guess, honestly, to be truthful with everyone right now, I think I'm just venting my feelings, honestly. And I apologize if this has gone on for too long. I, I have been thinking about this more and more lately, and and it it just comes out of my face. And I, I, 
I, I apologize. I, I'm going to stop. <laughs> Take a break. <laughs> All right, we're back from the break. Today's episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. If you're a clinician out there, uh, go to betterhelp.com slash in Seattle to get started as a therapist or counselor who, or psychologist or psychiatrist or psychiatric nurse who actually wants to do uh, teletherapy over BetterHelp, uh, on BetterHelp. Um, and here's what I will read my script now. <laughs> I actually wrote this script. They, they gave me a script and I was like, I don't want to read that script. I'm going to write my own script. So let me read my own script. Many of you clinicians have emailed me asking questions about how to build your practice. Well, there's a solution. Online therapy. And that's where BetterHelp comes in. If you're interested in building an online practice, go to betterhelp.com slash in Seattle to get started. Make sure you use the slash in Seattle because that helps us out. That basically shows BetterHelp that this advertisement is working. <laughs> Uh, research shows that people are increasingly turning to online therapy for various reasons. Research also shows that research that I've looked into also shows that online therapy can be effective in helping people. Um, and we need it to be effective for helping people because uh, most people can't do in-person therapy these days in my area anyway. Um, and I have colleagues and supervisees who love doing, the, doing this sort of work, doing, you know, working for online therapy outfits. So if you're interested, it's definitely worth checking out, seeing if it's for you. Also, I've been told by BetterHelp that they take care of, of a lot of the business stuff for you, like getting clients, taking care of billing, taking care of insurance, etc. So go to BetterHelp.com slash in Seattle to get start, started. That's BetterHelp.com slash in Seattle to get started. All right, let's go on to an email here. This email is from an upper tier, upper tier patron, anonymous patron. She writes, can you talk about the white male Asian female couple situation? I live in San Francisco. I'm in my mid-20s. I'm in tech. And I am in, I am in a WMAF. So that's white male, Asian female. WMAF relationship. As are nearly all my friends and those in my community. While I have not been shamed outright for not fighting the emasculated Asian male image, and uh, I've not been shamed outright for internalizing colonialist standards of attraction, I feel guilty at times for being, being an Asian woman dating a white man. My friends and I have gone on dates with Asian men specifically to even out our ratio, and our white male partners have done the same as they've had to confront their own yellow fever. We're desperately trying to signal that we're not racist against our own race. I would really love some nuanced conversation about this. Discourse online is overwhelmingly negative towards Asian females. It's heartbreaking. On a personal level, I love my relationship. It has always been about personal attraction, not tokenization or fetishization. Outside of that, I'm embarrassed to be part of the cliche WMAF relationship. At the end of the day, the attraction is wrapped up in very real racist problems. I would love to have a framework on unpacking and working through this particular shame uh, along with any of your thoughts on the matter. End of email. Uh, so I am mixed race. I am uh, half Japanese American, half European American, and uh, my dad is the Asian. Uh, some people don't automatically know that they should since my last name is Honda, but what are you going to do? And I will say that it was uh, a bit of a rare thing. You know, people would often just assume that if I was half Asian, that my mom was Asian because that, that is a frequent configuration. And so I remember bumping up against that uh, growing up. But anyway, so many of you might not know this, but so let me explain a lot of the things that my uh, Asian sister is talking about here. So there's this uh, movement, if you will, or awareness in the Asian male, uh, you know, um, culture that uh, of a number of different things that that make Asian male, Asian American males upset. Um, there's often this idea of being emasculated that Asian males are made to be not really men that they're like kind of like women in a way that they're slight and weak and short and shy and, you know, not aggressive and this kind of thing. Um, and also that they're not attractive. So 
there, and it's a real thing. It's a real phenomenon. There, there is a racism and a, um, I guess, sexism in a sense against Asian males that is noticeable, that Asian males are often uh, passed over by women of any race, that they're often made to you know, be invisible or that they don't really matter. And now it's not a universal thing, uh, but, it, but it is a thing. And they're among Asian males. It's a known conversation topic. You know, Asian males online or in person, there, there's a. It's a known topic. It's just like, yeah, us Asian men, we're always being emasculated and passed over by women. Even Asian women, our Asian American women, are passing us over. So, uh, so that's that's something that you should know about if you don't know. Uh, my Asian sister also uh, talked about the white male Asian female thing. So W W M A F is a known thing as well. It's been around for decades, and it's this notion. It, it has a whole history of you know going back to you know World War II. You could go back even before that, but Vietnam War where white male GIs, military folks, would, when they, when they were either colonializing or they were, um, you know, overseas, they would uh, bring home Asian women wives, this kind of thing. And so it definitely has a colonialist history. And uh, when white people impose their will on brown people, we can often conceptualize it within a colonialism framework. It's not always accurate to do so, in my opinion, but it definitely has um, some feeling. It's essentially, white people are taught that they're entitled and that brown people are taught that they're not entitled. And so white people will en- enact their entitlement on brown people, including in romantic relationships. Um, so another uh, aspect of this is is racism, right? And uh, you know, white privilege. So the, the, the reason, so she's saying that although she hasn't been the target, she knows people who have been the target where some of her Asian friends are being yelled at for dating white men. And what they're, what they're being yelled at is a lot of times by Asian men by, you know, saying you're, you're dating outside of your race or you're just dating a white guy because you're trying to gain white privilege. You're trying to gain legitimacy um, and you're turning away from your own race and, and you're, you're turning away from your Asian heritage by uh, dating white men. And uh, so there's that. There's also, she also mentioned yellow fever, which is a, a term we use for white men who or white people who are uh, sexually romantically attracted to Asian Americans. And or Asians in general. And uh, traditionally, there's a phenomenon. It's not always true, of course, but there are some white men who are attracted to Asian women because they believe stereotypically that uh, Asian women are exotic or subservient and they're looking for an exotic subservient woman. And uh, believe me, when they marry them, they realize that those stereotypes are silly (laughs) because Asian women are some of the least subservient people on the planet. Um, uh, So (laughs) anyway, uh, believe me, as an Asian person who has Asian women in my family, uh, they're they're not universally subservient if if that is on your brain. Um, So that's what the yellow fever is referring to. Yeah. So I could talk about this for a long time. And of course, you could take a whole uh, series of courses in college on this topic. But just very briefly, yeah, you know, this whole phenomenon or, you know, because when we study it, we we look at the romantic and attraction uh, behavior of groups of people. And we do see a signal where Asian males are passed over. You know, when you give pictures of people, different races to, you know, would you date this person? Would you date this person? Um, Black women are also another passed over group of people. Um, And so you'll see kind of the reverse in terms of gender there. You'll see uh, black women will yell at black men for dating white women, right? Um, Or uh, in same sex relationships as well. And so uh, so there are different groups uh, for whatever reason that we could speculate 
as to what sort of racist notion is driving that against black women and against, I mean, so what people will say, and it's speculation, of course, but what a lot of the experts will say is that um, because Asians are seen as weak and timid and subservient, the men lose in that equation because they, they're seen as less of a man. And whereas black people are seen as aggressive and assertive and strong, and that's the the silly stereotype. And so um, strong in sort of the physical way, you know. And so the women lose in that equation because women are made to seem more masculine and, and thus less attractive on average to, to people. That's what, you know, we're just talking about averages. And so, so uh, we see those effects and it's a real thing and it's a problem. And if you're an Asian man and you're trying to date uh, and you're frustrated, then you're going to be like, gosh, darn it. I am it. because of racism. I can't get a Tinder date. And if you're a black woman, you're like, gosh, darn it, this sucks. I, I can't get my needs met because I live in a racist society. And when it comes to dating apps, like people don't, uh, you know, it's one thing to ask people to go on a march. It's, a, it's one thing to ask people to donate to a charity. It's another thing to ask people to date someone, <laughs> you know, for to against their natural inclinations. Right. So even though, you know, we so in other words the same the same uh the same asian woman who marches for marches against racism and maybe even be a an asian uh you know american studies major when when it comes to tinder all bets are off people just swipe right or left based on their gut right it's we don't usually do charity swipes on on uh on Tinder. Anyway, I hope, hope you hear what I'm saying. So yeah, um, it's definitely all this, all these phenomena are, are measured. These phenomena are measured. We see them uh, and it's definitely uh, uh, theorized and conceptualized to be related to racism in history, stereotyping, privilege, marginalization, unfair attitudes. So, you know, we all need to think about that. The, these are things that we, that we need to think about. However, attraction on an individual level is attraction. <laughs> People often have a type. And is that type, is our attraction effect, is our individual attraction affected by racism and culture? Absolutely. But what, what is the individual supposed to do about it? You know, it's hard, if, you know, for you, uh, upper tier anonymous patron in San Francisco, what are you supposed to do about your attraction? You know, you're talking about how you've dated Asian men because you don't want to seem racist, but you're, and you had a longer email where you talked about this. You're doing it not because you actually want to date Asian men, but because you just want to appear like you're not being racist. So you're just wasting Asian guys time. <laughs> Uh, those Asian guys could be doing something else with their time, right? If, if you're not into it. But I, I get the impulse because if you're being yelled at by people, now I do find it interesting that women are being yelled at in this instance. It just, there's some kind of sexist issue there. It's not like Asian men can't be sexist, right? But anyway, what is the individual supposed to do about their programming? Are they supposed to sit down and spend 15 years trying to deprogram their sexual and and romantic attraction and, and probably not succeed. The individual can't change anything. We need to change the system, change the system, change the culture, change the society. So don't yell at in the same way as don't yell at the, or don't think ill of the individual conservative who is in the far right echo chamber. That's just where they are situated in the culture. Uh, you can, you have to change the system or, you know, feel free to yell at anyone you want to. You're, you know, you live in a free country, but if we actually want to change something, if, if we're actually interested, you know, if you're an Asian guy and you're upset about the fact that women aren't attracted to you as much as you wish they were, then the solution is not to yell at women to make them date you. <laughs> <laughs> we all understand that, right? Um, this the the solution is to change the system because uh, 
there are so many groups of people who we don't categorize and don't lose out on Tinder. So why is that? Well, because we just don't have a history of doing that to that group. So we have to change the system. What do we do? Well, you vote along these lines. You educate. You get educated. Integration of, of races, integration of all d- diverse peoples. Um, that's one thing that you'll see. People out there who actually grow up in, in diverse uh, communities often will have romantic attractions to a broader range of people. Whereas, you know, for me, I was one of the only people of color in my whole entire city. Uh, and so uh, for me, it, it was all white people. And so, you know, dating for me, it was, it was white people because Asian people were my cousins and sisters and stuff. And so, uh, so if we integrate societies more and uh, now how do we do that? You don't force someone to live in a neighborhood. You, you address systems of power so that integration just naturally happens. You uh, listen more. We want, we want more representation. Uh, then this is, this is actually a big deal when it comes to this topic. If, if you want to de-emasculate Asian men, then we need to have more Asian men in movies and in television shows. It's 2020. And I, when I watch movies and television shows and an Asian face shows up, I am on the, I am on the edge of my seat worried that that Asian face is going to have an accent, is going to have an Asian accent. It's like, because to me, when I see an Asian face in my world, they are Americans. They have American accents. They have lived in this country for decades and generations. I have lived in Washington State for four generations. And so when I think Asian American, when I think Asian face in a, in an, you know, if, if it's a Chinese movie <laughs> or a movie about China or something, then fine. But, you know, if I'm watching Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt or I'm watching, uh, you know, what's another TV show? <laughs> Get Shorty. I've been watching Get Shorty lately. And an Asian face shows up. I am internally cringing, just saying, oh, please, no accent. Please, no accent. And nine times out of 10, it's an Asian accent. Why is that? Even though something like 7% of Americans are Asian Americans. Let me look that up. 6%. 6% of Americans are Asian American. Are six percent of protagonists and heroes are they are they Asian American? Six percent of the uh, heroes in the uh, you know Marvel movies were were they Asian American? Six percent of the secondary characters on a TV show on a sitcom are they Asian Americans? No, they are not. <laughs> I am here to tell you, it is widely skewed to. Uh, not having them. Now, what are you going to do about that? Do you, do you pass a law in Hollywood that says you have to have 6% of your heroes be Asian American? No, what you do is you raise awareness and you keep, you put the pressure on these people. And you're just like, and especially when you actually replace Asian characters in a movie and we replace them with a white person, the, the script and the story calls for an Asian and you put a white person in there, like Emma Stone playing an, a, a Hapa person, like, you know, a, a part Asian person in that uh, movie in Hawaii, or, you know, the great one in the Marvel uh, universe played by, uh, what's, what's her face? Uh, you know, this is obviously a, a Tibetan or Chinese character from that area of the world who is wearing those clothes and speaking that language and they put a white person in there so hollywood just has this thing about that and when a movie like crazy rich asian come, comes out um, all of us asian americans are freaking out it's like oh my god a mainstream movie that's just all asians that's crazy talk like everyone flood to the movie theaters let's watch this this rom-com <laughs> and you know the movie was okay it wasn't mind-blowing but it was just like such a novelty like wait hollywood made a movie that's about asians you know like that's cr- and of course it's not it's not exclusively about asian americans it's 
It's about some Asian Americans, but it's vastly about Asians who live in Asia, by the way. I just want to point that out. Or Asians who live in England. But anyway. Um, so representation, you know, so there's things that we can do. We can look at science. We need to study. This. So we need to change the system in order to, uh, it, it, so people out there. So, uh, anonymous patron from San Francisco. Uh, I don't know what you could do individually to change this. You're attracted to who you're attracted to, but if you want to do something, then it, when people speak out to you or to others and say like, I can't believe, you know, did you see, did you see Jane? She's, she's dating a white guy. You speak out and say, look, individuals do not have much control over who they're attracted to in the same way that gay people can't change the fact that they're attracted to people of the same gender and the way that heterosexual people can't uh, change their, uh, their gender, uh, sexual orientation, uh, you know, who they're sexually attracted to regarding gender. Uh, we don't have a lot of individual control over our sexual and romantic attraction. But yes, I agree. We do have a problem in our society and we are a product of that problem. So let's not, let's not blame the individual. Let's blame the system and let's try to change the system. Let's work together to change the system. Because if we change the system, presumably, theoretically, in all likelihood, in 50 years, 100 years, uh, there, there, there won't be an emasculation of Asian men. There won't be a masculization of black women. There, there won't be those things if, if we actually change the system. And then we won't have to yell at people about their sexual preferences and their attraction preferences. We just won't have to do that. All right, let's go on to another email. All right, this next email is from up, uh, Upper Tier Anonymous Patron. She writes, How should international students cope with hate? I am an international student from India on a student visa. Trump started targeting legal immigrants on visas very recently through various executive orders. Me and my peers have been feeling very, very dehumanized and undervalued, and I have been feeling particularly very, very hated lately. I don't think I've felt this hated by others in my lifetime. Wherever I look, be it comments on news articles, my Twitter feed, etc., I see ton of hate directed towards people like me. I had other very recent negative experiences too. For example, I told someone very recently that I'm an international student in the U.S. He got scarily angry at me and yelled, go back to your own country. I used to happily tell people about my journey where I grew up, did my undergrad, did internships, etc., all in different countries. I typically share my travel experiences with others with a ton of joy and passion. But these days I am scared to share I'm scared to share these things with uh, I'm scared to share these things with others. I worry that they will hate me for being from India or hate me for my accomplishments, etc. These people think I don't belong here and that I should be thrown out. I feel very very alone. Uh, so just chiming in here before I read the rest of the email. I'm so sorry, anonymous patron, that you're going through this. It is deplorable. It it is it is mind-blowingly upsetting to me that in 2020, uh, all of the work Martin Luther King, all the work of the marching, all the work of so many people, uh, Barack Obama, to dismantle uh, racism is is being undone because of, of racism in our society and because of leaders and because of echo chambers, as I've been talking about. It is, it is deplorable. And I am, I am enraged, enraged by what you're going through. You are someone from India who came to the United States and studied at a university. What is the problem, people? And, you know, you just want to yell at these white people. It's just like, you're a effing immigrant, too. I'm trying not to swear anymore. I just really want to swear in this moment, though. You know what I mean? You are an immigrant. You are not from this land. You invaded this land, white person. You've invaded so many lands, white person. If anyone should go home, it should be you. You were the people that did terrible things. I'm trying not to say terrible words. You were the one who, 
who invaded. You were the one who exploited. You were the one who stood on slaves and built your empire. You were the one who colonialized. You were the one who spread smallpox. You were the one who genocided. You were the one who broke treaties. Oh, it just, it just makes you, you know. Now, full disclosure, I have a line in my, on my white side that are those people. I have an English Welsh line um, on my mom's side that are those people, probably slave owners, and uh, or at least slave adjacent. Adjacent, although one of my ancestors, ancestors, you could call him a white slave, an indentured servant, um, in the 1600s. Anyway, I, I also have white ancestors who were Quakers, who would free black slaves secretly, and were against slavery. But so I'm not saying. My lineage isn't a part of that, but, but for you, anyone, to be made to feel as afraid, to be made to, to, to be dehumanized, and for what? For what, people? For what? For what? Why? Rhetoric, white supremacy, power, trying to get votes thrumming up fear in your base. We should be so far beyond this. We should be so beyond it. And the fact that we have voters who have control over my society who vote for this sort of crap is just, it's, it's deplorable. And I'm so sorry that you're going through this. And I'm right there with you. Uh, you know, by your side, telling you that you don't deserve that treatment. You don't deserve to feel hated. You don't deserve dehumanization. You don't deserve to be undervalued. You deserve to be proud of your travels. You deserve to be proud of where you're from and where you are and what you're doing and the, you know, the tone of your skin and the accent you have, you deserve to be proud of that. It's a wonderful thing. And for someone to say, go back to your country, I just, I just want to, you know, there's just no good comeback for that, right? It's like, well, you're a white person. You didn't come from this country. I mean, that's a good, but you know, the, the fantasy in my head is to grab that person and sit them down clockwork orange style and make them watch like, I don't know, 200 hours of documentaries telling them that uh, telling them the silliness and the ridiculousness of that statement for a white person to tell a, a, an international student on a student visa to go to go back to their own country i mean you know to prop their eyes open with with toothpicks and make them watch just 200 hours of documentaries just detailing how stupid they are <laughs> Not they are, but their ideas are. So, yeah, I, I, I'm so sorry that you're going through that. And know that you have, you, have a, you have a group of people who accept you. You have a group of people who accept you for everything that you are. And you have a group of people that is just as hurt and just as angry as you are at those people, at those racists. It's just... Uh, I mean, I, I just don't, I, it, I, other countries have this too. It's, you know, United States isn't the only society that has a problem with this. We have a particular problem with the particular part of this, but I, I've been around the world long enough to know that this is, this is a human society thing. Other societies have it less. Other societies have it more. You know, for example, in Japan, they're, massively racist against certain other people so it's not like japanese people is my other lineage isn't also racist in their own country in their own power structure um yeah very upsetting you go on to say in the email my therapist is not a person of color that has never gotten in the way and he has got me through some diff very difficult times but now i really feel like he can't understand certain things about me i know that he's liberal and not a trump supporter but I overanalyze certain things, and he says, and that I, I over I overanalyze certain things that he says, and I start feeling like he is thinking what all these people online and in real life are saying. 
um, just chiming in here. Yeah, this is actually something that I've been talking with people about re- more recently because of the increased awareness and the di- and the uh, dichotomy between Black Lives Matter um, supporters and those who don't really get it, even among liberals. Uh, in that, a-, a lot of clients are concerned about this. It's like, you know, my therapist, because because most the therapists are overrepresented by white people. And, and women as well. And there's, uh, you know, a pretty good chance that if you're a person of color as a client, you probably don't have a person of color a, as a therapist, um, just law of averages. Obviously not always, but uh, but anyway, there's a lot of clients who are uh, switching therapists more recently to people of color or even specifically to their particular version of in color, you know, like... Um, if you are mixed race, some people are looking for mixed race therapists as a way of really trying to fine tune their uh, relationship with a therapist so they can really understand, you know, really feel like your therapist understands you. So, so I think that your dilemma is, is common and it makes a lot of sense. It's just like, well, I know my therapist is great and you know, he's a white guy, but, you know, he's been really great over the years. But and, and I know that he doesn't t- he hasn't said anything that indicates that he's racist against uh, Indian people or foreign people. But I don't know. So I'm going to chime in here now and speak to you therapists who are listening. Please, for the love of God, if you haven't already, overtly bring up the topic of racism, sexism, ableism, sizeism, or whatever it is that you intuit the client might have on their mind. Don't wait for the, because, you know, a lot of schools of thought are like, well, you know, wait till the client brings it up, then talk about it. No, you are the leader of that relationship. You're the leader of the discourse. So you have to be the one as a therapist to introduce certain ideas and certain uh, topics because the client might not feel safe to do so. We have a client right here who has written in, and although she likes her therapist and he's a white guy, she's not sure what is going on in his mind and how scary would that be? Now, you know, some people might, be, might say, well, just bring it up. Well, what if bringing it up, you risk as a client causing the therapist to say like, well, you know, some of the things Trump says about race, I agree with. And then you're completely unsafe. You're thrown off. You know, it's it's up to you, and you can even do this in your disclosure statement. That's what I do. I, I have statements that I am, for example, LGBTQIA friendly in my disclosure statement. So before even anyone talks to me, they read that in there. And it, but that's not the only place. I actually bring it up as well. You know, like one thing you can say as a therapist in every situation is different, but you can just say like, so, um, you know, if if I was a white person and I was, and I had a Indian international student client, I might say something like, especially in today's environment, I might say something like, so, uh, you know, I've been watching the news like everyone else and uh, as a white person and as a therapist, I've been thinking about my privilege and about racism against all sorts of people, including people from other countries for a long time. But as a white person, I have to just recognize that I just don't know what it's like to, to not be white. I don't know what it's like to be a person of color. And I'm doing my best to try to learn. I'm doing my best to try to really get um, you know, educated and understand the, and listen to the voices of people of color and, and foreign people. Uh, but I just have to say, I, I just want to bring it up to you as a client and, and say, you know, I'm, I'm willing to talk about it. Um, and I just want to be clear that I'm not, I'm, I'm desperately striving to not be racist. And I'm very much open to hearing anything from you about this topic, even if it includes you telling me that I made a mistake. I, I'm, I'm willing to say that I make mistakes sometimes. As a white person, I'm inevitably going to make mistakes because it's, I, I'm a product of my society, but believe me, I'm trying. And so um, now, 
the key here is this so stepping out of the role play. The key here is you don't, and this is something that some white people will do, is they will require the person of color to inform them and educate them. People of color, some are willing to do that, but sometimes it gets tiresome, especially if you're a client. You're just like, so now as a client, I'm supposed to educate my therapist about what it's like to be a person of color when they should look that up themselves. They should educate them. They should talk to their friends. They should talk to other people. You know, they should go to trainings or whatever it is that you do as a therapist. Why am I as a client having you? Now, like I said, some people of color have the energy. I, I, I often have the energy to do that. When people ask me, you know, though, as the token person of color, they'll be like, what do you think? You know, I, I don't have a problem. As you know, I don't mind talking. I don't mind ranting. <laughs> uh, but some people don't. Some people are just like, ah, I don't want to have to be that person. So, so you don't want to put it on your client to say, you have to educate me, you know. But you do have to introduce the notion that it's a safe space and that you're open and that you are willing to hear criticism and that you're doing everything you can and that you do not support any racist rhetoric uh, and that you, uh, you know, you're humble and you're willing to listen and, you know, all those kinds of things. And I know a lot of you therapists out there will do that because some of you will email me about that and I commend you for that. But as a client, what do you do? I mean, like I said, uh, it should be the therapist that should step forward. Um, this is similar to if you had a gay client and you're straight to, to just come out and say, so by the way, I just want to tell you, um, you've told me, you know, this is me as a therapist. So I've said this before. It's like, okay, you've told me that you're gay. I just want to tell you I'm straight. Uh, and um, I, I want to be upfront about that because... I want to tell you that I don't want you to wonder what's going on. And, you know, maybe you weren't wondering, but I just want to, I didn't, I want to make it clear that you could ask me about that kind of thing because I don't want you to be off kilter in that way. Um, also know that I have stri strived in my life to striven. What's the end of the uh, past? Um, I have tried, uh, uh, endeavored my entire life to uh, be aware of, the um, struggles and the lives of everyone, namely those uh, groups of people that I'm not a part of because many of my clients come from other groups, whether it be women or, um, you know, so I'm a half, I'm a mixed race person. So I would say like full race people, <laughs> uh, gay people, bisexual people, trans people. So I just want to throw that out there and I'm willing to talk about it. We don't have to talk about it, but I'm absolutely willing to talk about it. And, I might say heterosexist things. I might say um, things that are homophobic. Uh, I'm sh believe me, I'm trying not to. But if I ever do, feel free to just call me out on it, and I will acknowledge it, and I'll hear you, and you can you can you can say that to me. You're you're free to do that. So, as a therapist, you can't just sit back and say like, well, you know, if it comes up, it comes up. You know, okay, they're gay, or they're trans, or they, uh, they, they might have body issues. I don't know. They'll bring it up if they bring it up. No, bring it up, introduce it, uh, create a safe space. Going on with your email here. I just don't know how to cope with all this. Oh, actually getting back to you as a client. So you can bring it up with, with your therapist. You can just say, so, uh, you know, more recently I've been kind of worried. I've been getting all these things online and about anti- people like me. And I, I've been a little worried that as a white person, you might agree with some of these things. You've never said that you agree, but without any information, I'm just, I'm just really worried. And it's kind of getting in the way of my relationship with you. So can we talk about that? You have every right to bring something like that up. And therapists should, and usually do manage those conversations well enough. Anyway, going on with your email. I just don't know how to cope with all this. What can international students and legal immigrants whose lives have been turned upside down by the Trump administration do at this time? How do we cope with all of this hate? So I don't know. You know, this is a good question that I get often is how do I cope with racism? How do I cope with sizeism? How do I cope with sexism? It's just it's everywhere. How, how do I cope with it? I don't know. I don't know if it's humanly possible to cope with it. It's a similar thing as if someone was punching you every day at work. Every time you arrived at work, someone just punched you in the face and you came to me and you said, 
how do I cope with this? Well, I think most people would say like, well, you don't, wait, like you're being punched every day at work. I don't think anyone can cope with that. And I don't think that's the right question. We shouldn't be asking the victims of racism to struggle with their coping skills. We should be ending racism. So, you know, but it is a valid question in the short term. It's just like, what do I do? Well, I have some tips based on very little information that you have shown out, that you've thrown out. So you say in your email, whenever I look, uh, be it comments on news articles, my Twitter feed, et cetera, I see a ton of hate directed at, at toward people like me. That was the passage you wrote in the email. So one way to cope is to be very careful about what you expose yourself to on the internet. You say comments on news articles. The comment section on news articles is one of the worst most deplorable places you can go. And it can make you think that that is the normal, that's normal society. But my suspicion, and I don't have any data to back this up, is that it's not real society. These are just the people who happen to feel the need to create an account, which you usually have to do, and then comment. That's a very particular sort of person. You know, uh, I actually have some firsthand knowledge of this. Like when I post something on YouTube, I sometimes, you know, occasionally will get a lot of negative comments where it'll just be like, you know, extreme, just extreme negativity. It's like, you know, you are an idiot, you know, and you're talking about you're a cuck, you know, just all these things. But then I look at my, um, how many likes I got versus how many dislikes I got. And it, you know, it's like 99% likes or 98% likes versus 2% dislikes. You know, on YouTube, you can do the thumbs up, thumbs down. So in the, in the comment section, it's 90% negative, but in the thumbs up, thumbs down, it's 98% positive. So what's going on there? Well, it's obvious. Those who have something negative to say, will say it. Those who have something neutral or positive to say, aren't likely to say it in certain arenas. So you are essentially stepping into a toxic environment when you look at the comments on news articles, when you look at your Twitter feed. Twitter, I don't use Twitter. I don't even really get it, to be honest. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't decipher how it works. Like when I, I'll, cause I, we do have a Twitter and you can follow us. We will, we'll post things on Twitter occasionally, but not usually we're, we're usually on Instagram or Facebook and follow us if you haven't yet. But on, on Twitter, I have a hard time understanding like when, cause I, I'll get these notifications that someone will, you know, at us in a comment. And I'm like, it's like some kind of reply to something. I don't really, anyway, the point is, is that from my friends who use Twitter, they will tell me that Twitter is a cesspool, especially if you follow certain kinds of things and you um, don't tailor your Twitter feed towards the things that you want to see. Now, that's the echo chamber issue as well, and I suppose that's something to think about. But but I this this is what I do. So I'm not telling you what you should do. I'm just telling you what I do. I do not look at certain areas of the internet because it will demoralize me. It'll ruin my day. It might ruin my week. It'll depress me. And so I, I don't, I don't look at it. Now, some people are like, well, you're putting your head in this. I had once, I once had a family member that said that to me, a, an in-law that was like, oh, you're just putting your head in the sand. It's like F off, dude. Like everyone has the right to avoid being demoralized. It's, you know, that's what these a-hole negativists want you to do is for you to read that stuff. That's what they're hoping. They want to hurt you. And so we give them power by looking at them. And one of the best things you can do is just look away like, yeesh, looking away on that one. And so uh, I, I would th really think about what, and everyone can do this, really think about the particular corner of the internet that you are exposing yourself to because it can traumatize you. It is a, it's a real thing. I've been traumatized by the internet. I've clicked on things, images that are burnt into my brain, violent videos that I, I was like curious about. It's like, Oh, this, this, you know, this thing happened, I'll click on it. And then you, and 
to this day, I have this one, I won't even tell you about it. It's just, it was a, it was a security camera footage of a very, very violent, horrific thing that was happening to children. And I cannot get rid of it in my brain. And, and it, I shouldn't have looked at it. It's not a good thing for that to got to have gotten into my brain. I can't imagine re looking at Twitter all day long and being demoralized by the, by the things that are posted there. So, you know, be very careful about what you do. The other thing is to get with people who support you and, you know, get, find allies like me, you know, find um, true Americans who aren't racist, find true Americans who understand that America is based on the reduction of, or the elimination of oppression. It is based on laws. It's based on freedom. It's based on equality for all. It's based on immigration and, and celebrating diversity. That's what our country is based on. That's what true America is. And get with, so get with true Americans and, you know, absorb their support and their vibe and their positivity and their validation. Get with them. Because if you're, I can just imagine you're a student, you're studying all the time, and then you get a little break from your studies and you go on Twitter. You know, I just can't imagine how horrible that must be for you. I don't know if that's what's happening for you, but I could, I could see a lifestyle like that. So that, that's my advice. But, you know, the main thing is, is that uh, I, am in, I am enraged and I am hurt by the things that you said, by the hate that you have experienced. It enrages me. It truly does. All right. Well, everyone out there, please take care of yourself and take care of others, please, because we all deserve it.